We are in Mark 2. We're looking at the greater miracle. The greater miracle is not just forgiveness. It's a greater miracle than forgiveness. It's the greater miracle of changing the a person's heart to change the soul, the will, the mind towards God. We talked about this before, but this is a chapter where Jesus clearly again says that physical healing is important. It is not essential in this world. It is important. He goes around healing people physically, but he doesn't heal everyone. But it's not essential, and he's going to make that announcement in here, and he's going to say, because of the contrast of physical healing versus being made whole, one is very less than the other, very much less than the other. Some of you have dedicated your life to see people being healed physically and emotionally. Uh, we desire a holistic healing for people. But we know if you live long enough, not everyone will be physically or emotionally healed. It just will not happen in this life. The greater miracle is to be healed spiritually, to be made whole with God. That is what this chapter is about. I was reading about a family, the Hoist family. They are from Germany. Rudolf oversaw Auschwitz and he helped kill a million point one Jews. He would go home to his family and he was a family man, loved his kids. The people around him did not know that he was such a brutal killer. Matter of fact, most of his family did not know. He oversaw experiments on people while they were alive and many cruel things that we just wouldn't want to talk about here. Over a million people died by his hands. His grandson found out about it, Rainer, much later in life. It was hid from him and when he found out he found out because he would mention his name and people would recoil and quit conversations with him and finally a couple of Jewish people spit on his feet and said, how dare he mention that name. He began to look into his family history and he was appalled and he began a ministry, if you will, to the Jewish people towards reconciliation. It so affected him that he tat put a tattoo of the Star of David on him and he began to put survivors on his arm and he began to reach out to people to reconcile. These stories are inspiring. But if you listen to his story, he ran into a problem. And the problem was that he could reconcile with people who wanted to be reconciled, but he could not make people reconcile that did not want to be reconciled. In other words, he couldn't change the heart. He couldn't change the soul of a person, the affections, the desires, the willingness. He said, oh, if I could reach in and just grab hold of their hearts. There's only one who can do that. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. He can make you whole from the inside. He can change your affections, your will, your desires. It is a supernatural work. It is greater than physical healing. To change a soul towards rebellion towards God is the greatest miracle of all. To change a person's heart that is against God, to walk against the Lord, to turn around and walk with the Lord, that's repentance, it's just turn around. And to believe in the Lord, that's the greater miracle. That's what this chapter is about, that God can make you whole. You see in chapter 2, if you got your Bible with me, I hope you got it open. I hope you read along with me. Verse 1, it's when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. He comes home, not to his house. He says in another passage that he has no house. He has no place to lay his head. He's given up all that to go to the cross, but he comes home. He comes to Peter's house, most likely, and it's his home base in Capernaum. We have found Peter's house, by the way, archaeologists have. It was expanded seven times before they had to stop. You can see the growth of the early church and how cell groups and small groups met in houses, and they kept building on to it as far as they could. He comes home. He, he comes to Peter's house. That's what hospitality is all about, is when you make people feel at home, when you, when you make people feel welcome with you. That's what he does here. He comes home. Verse 2, 
many were gathered together that there was no more room, not even at the doors. The crowds have been following him, and now they've gone into a house, and they can't get in the house. There were thousands of them following him in, in the wilderness, and when he fed them, and now they've come into the city, and it's become a problematic deal. How do we get everyone close to Jesus? How can he touch everyone? How can he see everyone? How can he speak to everyone? And, and, and while he's at home, they crowd around the house. Maybe you could get 50 to 75 people in it, but there's hundreds, maybe thousands in the street. This becomes a problem everywhere he goes, and eventually he'll take his ministry back outside the towns and not come back in. But now he's at home, and they've followed him, and he's with the crowd. I just want to show you, first of all, number one, that Jesus has a love for the broken and the lost. He, he is going to give the miracle of forgiveness and healing and wholeness because he loves the broken and the lost. The Bible says Christ said himself, he came for the lost. He came for sinners, people who are in rebellion against him. That's the people he loves. He's claiming his own who are in rebellion against him. He loves the broken and the lost. Think with me for just a moment. Who's in the crowd? You got thousands of people. Who's in the crowd? I mean, think how eclectic this group is today. Well, we meet 500 people or so. Think how eclectic it is. Men, women, young, old, all kinds of different challenges, hurts, suffering, problems, sins we're facing, assaults we're facing, all the things that we're facing. Now, take 20,000. Or go to New York City or Atlanta or Charlotte, wherever, and just walk. You'll see everything under the sun. Again, men, women, young, old, gay, straight, all kinds of sins, all kinds of challenges, all kinds of backgrounds, all kinds of issues that people grew up with, everything that you can say. That's who's in the crowd. That's the crowd. It's no different today, just because 2,000 years have passed. They're in need in so many different ways, and we constantly see Jesus in the crowd. When he's not discipling the 12, he's in the crowd. It gets summed up in the Gospels as this, tax collectors and sinners. People who are in rebellion against God and tax collectors is the worst of the rebellious. He, he's going around with the rebellious and the worst of the rebellious. We wouldn't say tax collectors today. We wouldn't say IRS because they're listening if you're on the grid. But you might say some group of people, pedophiles. For some people, unfortunately, they would say gays. For some people, they might say a group of people with a collar of skin. For some people, they might say a political party. For some people, they might say who hold a certain belief. I hope there's no one that you find so deplorable you administer to them. I, I know most of you. I know that's not your challenge. I was told that a few weeks ago by a man. He shared with me that he won't be back here. He finds gay people deplorable. I think I said I was praying for them to reach out to them and serve them and hopefully see them have the gospel in their lives. He said, I find that deplorable. Is there anybody that's deplorable to you? Is there anybody you recoil from? Is there anybody you won't go to? That's a challenge maybe for a few, but I think our bigger challenge is how do we get into the crowd and stay there and go deeper and love them? How do we get out of our Christian bubble? How do we get out of the church some? How do we get out of our groups? And how do we get into the crowd and actually speak? Actually ask questions, actually challenge, actually reach out, actually serve with no expectations of anything back. That's Jesus' life and ministry. Now, there's some challenges there, right? I mean, he doesn't have a job. He doesn't have a wife and kids. There's some challenges there. I, I think we could all be honest and say, we understand that. But the, stay, the thing still stands in front of us. How do we get in the crowd? How do we have the same heart he has to be around people who are different than us? Now he's in the crowd and he's ministering to them and he's serving them. And he knows a couple of things that keep him going. He knows the Father has given all things into his hands. And he knows everyone is without excuse. Romans 1.20 says, every person stands before God 
without excuse. Atheists, agnostic, no matter what they say, they are without excuse. They know better. He knows there's no true atheist. He knows there's no true thing. And so they revile him at times, attack him at times. They dismiss him at times as they will you and I. They're indifferent at times. But he keeps pressing forward with the gospel. Why? Because he knows they already know better. And he knows they need him. Everyone stands without excuse. Just somewhere on the side there on your note sheet, would you write in creation? Creation. Let's say it together. You ready? Creation. Everyone has creation witnessing against them that they are not the God of the universe they think they are. They cannot really be in control of their life. They can act like it for a while, but creation bears witness against them that there is a God who created them and they are responsible to him. They are accountable to him. Oh, they might suppress the truth, Paul says, but it's like, it's like holding a beach ball underwater. You only can hold it there for so long. You can only pretend for so long. You can only live a private life for so long. You can only do it for so long and then the ball comes up out of the water. Disaster comes eventually. And you find out you're not in control of your life. I want to be the one that's there when that happens with people. I hope you do too. Creation bears witness that they are accountable to God. Second is conscience. Their conscience bears witness, the scripture says, that they know better because God has put it inside them that they are disobeying God. They, they may think they have authority to cut someone's throat, but they know they don't want their throat cut. They want to be the cutter. They don't want to, they don't want to be the one cut. And the conscience bears witness that they are in rebellion, and he knows that. So everybody say conscience. You ready? Conscience. The conscience bears witness. So when you're speaking the gospel, when you're speaking of Christ, when you're asking questions, when you're probing and you see all kinds of responses, anger, foolishness, nonsense, I'm an atheist, I believe in evolution, I believe in dogs becoming cats, whatever you hear, they're covering up. They're covering up. And third is Christ. The Bible says, the scripture says, and Christ Jesus himself said that creation is bearing witness, conscience is bearing witness, and Christ comes to bear witness. So we go because conscience and Christ is there, and because the conscience and creation is there, we speak of Christ. We don't make them responsible. If we made them responsible, we should go with machine guns before they hear the gospel. They're already responsible. We go with eye-opening words of life. We go with Christ Jesus. Everybody say Christ. Ready? Christ. We go with the risen Messiah. He's come into town and he knows creation bears witness, conscience bears witness, and he now bears witness to those and gives more truth. Now, here's his authority. Number two is his authority. It's found right here. Here's his authority. He goes and he's among the crowd and he loves people and he's ministering to them and he calls them out of their sin he loves them too much to leave them where they are. Verse 2, many were gathered together. There was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. That's his authority. He's preaching the word to them. Now, I don't think he went around saying verses all the time. I do, matter of fact, you see that in Scripture. But everything is an ethos uh, for him, a, a worldview for him that God God created everything. God's there and God has reality, truth. Truth means reality. He believes that there's one reality. He doesn't believe we make up reality. You know, my truth, your truth, whatever you feel. He doesn't believe in the existential movement that's going on today. Whatever you see, feel, think in your own heart. He believes there is the truth. Did you notice that? Did you see that there he's preaching the word, the truth? Word, definite argo, it's the word, the reality to them. He's preaching the reality of God to them. He's preaching what God is like. He's proclaiming. A preaching has such a negative contents today. Don't preach at me. The old lady's preaching at me again. He came home preaching. Preaching means to proclaim with excitement. To proclaim with enthusiasm. It means to proclaim God's word with great excitement. You're proclaiming with your life and your words that Christ is real. 
Your life, my life, your words proclaim to people that Christ is real. He's proclaiming the word to them. It is not a word, it is the word. Some passages here out of John that give some background to this. John 8, 26, Jesus said, I declare to the world what I heard from him. He's going to all the world, wherever he's placed, to proclaim what the Father says to him. Now, he does that perfectly. I ask for that all the time when I get up here, but I ask for it on the streets. I ask for it when I'm in counseling. I ask for it when I'm with people that I love. I want to grow in this. I pray you do too, that everything we say is what we heard from him. Eventually, people do figure out whether you're making it up as you go, right? I mean, they do figure out if you're, figure out if you're making up life as you go and you're not living by authority, if it's your own authority. Eventually, especially if it's a wife, a husband, a child, they figure it out after a while. We want them to hear what the Father says to us. That's what he spoke, what the Father told him from heaven. Another verse out of John. Jesus said, the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. What to say in general and what to speak to people in specific situations. I, he says, I'm guided by him and his truth. I speak to the people what he says. Finally, in John Jesus said, you search the scriptures, graphe means writings. You search the canon, the writings that are put together. He saw a time when the writings would be put together, but he's mostly probably at the time also speaking of the Old Testament. You search the writings, the graphe. You think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. He said, how do you speak what the Father wants you to say? Be filled with the word. Be bubbling up with the word. Now again, you don't have to go into, we don't have to go into every conversation and say, well, Isaiah 52 says. Well, Hosea says. Well, Zechariah says. He's not meaning that, that you have to speak that way all the time. He's saying, let your words be guided by the truth. Let your thinking be guided by the truth. The scriptures tell us that we now have the mind of Christ. And as you fill your mind and heart with the word, it will become organic and more natural of a flow that what you say is from him. That's one of the reasons it's so important to abide, dwell, stay in the word. Because if you're like me, I have a tendency to tell people what I think. I've gotten better about how I do that and the manner in which I do that, but I still like giving my opinion if I'm not in the Word. And if I'm drifting a little bit, I'll just say whatever I feel like saying. I can do it. You can do it. Abide in the Word. Be in the Word. Abide. Dwell. Dwell in the Word. That's why community groups are so important. It's discipleship groups are so important. That's why our morning meetings with God are so important to meet him and be filled with the word. He said that was his authority to them. Remember a gospel conversation? We've defined this several times. It is, it is a conversation that points others to Christ and his truth. So when you say to someone, you're talking about evolution, you ask them a question, you, you say, you know, I think God created us. What do you think about nothing plus no one equals everything? You are having a gospel conversation. When you ask people, I struggle with matter becoming life. How did matter in inanimate objects become living things? What do you think about that? Joe, Bill, Mary, Sue? You're having a gospel conversation. When you bring in questions and life and bring in truth, you're speaking as Jesus would speak if he were here and you are closing in with the Spirit. The Bible tells us, Jesus told us, that if you speak of him, the Holy Spirit is saying to the person, this is true, this is true. You've got power with you. You've got, you got an amazing might of authority with you when you speak truth. The Spirit says to the person, and you don't often see by the reaction. I, I think we do. We just forget that their reaction being negative means we've often hit a core issue. But the Spirit's going in and saying, like driving a nail into two by fours, hey, this is true. This is true. You got that authority when you speak of him. 
That's his authority. And you notice that they've come to at least hear for a while. There's a season of hearing. Third, then you see these broken man's friends. You, you see that he is promising this greater miracle, something greater than forgiveness. So he goes around being around the broken and the lost, and he has an authority that comes from the Father. And he's got some friends that are collaborating with him with the gospel. Look at verse 3. Notice how many times it says they. And they came bringing to him a paralytic. He's paralyzed. He's on a mat. They're carry, he's carried by four men. Verse 4. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. Verse 5, and when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. These group of men, they loved their friend. They don't define what love is. They love. They love from the Father. They love from Jesus. They love with real love. First of all, they have compassion on this man. They have an inward desire for his eternal best that leads them to act on it. They don't just have pity for the man. They don't just have sympathy. They don't throw him a couple of quarters and say, hope you have a good day. They go and they take time out of their day and they leave something behind, family, job, other people. They go grab the man. They put him on a mat. They take him to where Jesus is. They stand outside. They talk to people. They say, can we get in? They can't get the crowd to budge. They maybe ask somebody, what would you do? Or they start talking among themselves and they go up on the roof. But it all started because they had compassion for this man. They wanted him to get close to Jesus. Second, they have faith in Christ they have faith in this Messiah. They do not have faith in faith. They do not have faith in faith. That's the big thing today. Just believe. Just be sincere. Just believe in your own thing. As long as you believe, all roads go up the mountain, lead to God. They don't have faith in faith. They have faith in Christ. They believe that he is God come to earth. They believe that he is the son of God. They have faith in the Messiah. They're, you see, your faith is only as good as the object to which you place your faith. They don't have faith in faith. They have faith in Christ. Third, you see in this text that they have teamwork, and that's, uh, uh, that's no little thing today, right? Getting churches together, getting people together, getting people going the same direction, working together. That's a work of the Spirit. You got busyness, different views, you got all this territorial stuff. You know, this is our place. That's your place. You got all this competing against you. To get people to join together with the gospel and to serve the community or the world, it's a big deal. It takes the work of the Spirit. And, and I know it's only four men. If you had eight men, it's double the trouble. If you have 16, it gets even problematic. You got 100, it's even more. You got 1,000, it's even more problematic. I just want to remind you, we're on the same team with every brother and sister in Christ in this community. If they really love Christ, if they really love Christ in his word, we're on the same team. The teamwork here is amazing. And then finally, this little word we'll just call tenacity. We don't speak about tenacity anymore, but it's a perseverance that I think older generations had, the great commitment generation had it. You get married, you stay married. You go to work, you give an honest day's work. You get hurt, you press on. There was a tenacity about them. Now they had some problems. That generation rarely said, I love you. If they came through the depression, they kept the depression. Many of them went through the depression, but they didn't get the depression out of them. If you're around somebody that went through the depression and you saw them reuse paper towels, you know what I'm talking about. Or wear the same dress for 20 years. But they had a tenacity about them that says, we don't quit. We don't quit. We're not quitters. God will provide. They had a tenacity about them. I, I saw a group, I, I don't know what they were protesting. Uh, they decided to duct tape themselves to a building. Uh, PETA, somebody, somebody saying the world needs to change by this cause. 
not by Christ. So they duct tape themselves to the building, and not just like a few times, I mean like hundreds of times. And if you ever cut duct tape, I mean, like you do it five, six times around, it's hard, and you do it a hundred times. I mean, it's like you need a, you need a, more than a hacksaw, you need a power saw. And to, it shows these policemen, these first responders, and they're cutting and cutting and cutting and cutting and cutting the duct tape and getting wore out and getting somebody else in there. And they're cutting and cutting and people falling off flagpoles and all kinds of stuff. I know it'd make you cry. And they're just, they're going all over the place getting these people with duct tape. And they're saying, you don't, you can't stay here. You don't belong here. And it's some group with a cause. But I love their tenacity. We must be, again, the most tenacious people on the earth that we go to any country, any place in the city, that we go out of our way to restore any relationship. There must be a tenacious nature about us to have people look at us and say, hey, they really believe what they believe. The tenaciousness or the tenacity of these men is really something. They, they go, there's a massive crowd, but they say, that's not going to stop us. Finally, as we take communion, I want to just focus the last 10 minutes or so. His proclamation that physical healing is not as important as being made whole. It's important, but it's not essential. It's important, but it's not essential. You can be made whole and go to hell. And be made whole physically and not love God. But if he makes you whole in your spirit, it's a change of heart affection towards God. Look at verse 5 again. He said to the man, he said, your faith has healed you. Your, now your sins are forgiven. And by the way, I just, I don't want to assume anything here. It's always to forgive us so he can restore us into intimacy. Forgiveness is never enough. We often talk about being forgiven, but it's, it's not enough. The forgiveness is so you can restore back to intimacy. When I hurt someone I love, like my wife, I don't want to just hear you, hear her say, hey, I forgive you. She could say that and just go on about her life and stay away from me. I want her restored. I want to see life again. I want to see a smile again. I want to see her trust me again. I want to see her lean back into me again. I don't want just an announcement of forgiveness. I want the restoration of the relationship. I want intimacy. That's from God. So let's don't assume, let's make sure we understand everybody here, forgiveness is just the doorway to intimacy. Verse 6, some of the scribes were sitting there. They're questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now the Pharisees, scribes, religious leaders are way off base usually, but they're on base here. Only God can absolve people of sins. Nobody can absolve people of sins but God. Only God can forgive. And they know it. And they declare that he should be put to death. Are you claiming to be God? They now make it public and they're now attacking him. Are you claiming to be God? And he says, yep. Or yes, he wouldn't say yep. Yes. Yes. And I'm going to show you. So that's the battle line. Verse 8. Immediately, Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that this was questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or say, rise, take up your bed, and walk? It depends where you are, right? I mean, if you're on earth, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven. You don't need to see anything right then. If you say you're healed, you need to see the man stand up, or you're a fake prophet. But if you're talking about eternity, making a person whole on the inside to love God is the greater miracle. Because the person could be physically healed and still die and still get cancer later. Lazarus died later on. He came out of the grave in an amazing way. He died later on. The great miracle is to change the heart towards God. That's God's work. Verse 9. 
So he explains there, verse 10, I'm sorry, verse 10. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Notice he didn't say to physically heal. He didn't say that. He said to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, verse 11, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. Verse 12, he arose and immediately picked up his bed. He went out before them all so that they were all amazed and glorified God saying, we've never seen anything like this. We've never seen anything like this. Never seen anything like this. Isaiah makes a great promise. He says, one day God will bring healing in the new covenant. He said he was pierced, Jesus was pierced through in his hands and so forth for our transgressions. Transgressions means step over the line. We knew better in conscience and creation. We said, well, I'm going to act like God anyway. I'm going to do my own thing sexually, physically, financially, relationally. I'll forgive if I want. If I don't, I don't care. I'll transgress. I'll, I'll step over the line. He came and he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The sins bubbled up into pollution and problems. Upon him was the chastisement, the punishment that brought us wholeness, peace, wholeness with God, peace with God, restoration. And with his wounds, we are healed. Now there's a group of people today that say that conjunction means that he spiritually heals us, but that he will physically heal you. You just must demand it in faith. You just must believe it in faith. And if you believe enough, you'll always be healed of anything. And you'll die of natural causes. Everyone who has real faith dies of natural causes, nothing else. I don't believe that. And I'll tell you why. Because the Bible says different. By the way, this is the only passage in the Old Testament you can pick this out. If you find somebody who builds a theology on one verse, let me give you a word. Run. That's what cults do. One verse. It's usually one or two verses. What does this conjunction mean? And with his wounds we are healed. Is it collaborating? Is it explaining? Yes, it is. Does God physically heal people today? Yes. But it's not promised. It's not a demand. We don't stand before God and say, I demand you stand on your promises and heal me. We don't demand anything of God here. You may, you'll hear that in the community, in places, not here. I believe he's good, but I believe he's sovereign. I believe he decides. I believe God is God. But here's the scripture. We like sheep have gone astray. There's something, this by the way is continuation in the sentences. It's it's a run-on thought. There's something going on that we're going astray that's causing us not to have peace and calling us not to have healing. He does not say physical problems. He says, no, there's this thing, part of your heart and my heart without God that we are like sheep who like to leave the pasture and make up our own lives. Peter translates this verse in the New Testament under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. He translates this verse. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to what? Not physical healing. So we see something going on. Peter says the main thing, there's important things, physical healing, you always ask for it and you trust God. You ask for it and you trust God. But there's something bigger. You could be physically healed and be as unrighteous as Hitler or anybody else you know. He said, go for the deeper. Go for the more. Go for the deep water. Live, it, live in righteousness. He explains, how do you live in righteousness? He translates Isaiah. By his wounds, same verse, same sentence, you have been, it means wholeness. It's translated wholeness. You've been made whole. What kind of wholeness do we get? For, because, continuation, it's not and this time, it's for or because. Because, for, you were straying like sheep, Isaiah. But you've now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your soul. You've now been returned to God. You've now reconciled. You've been made whole. 
When you come take communion today, there's two groups of people in here. One of you is going, one group is going to say, uh, I've been returned to God. And I'm going to just ask everybody to stay seated for a minute. One group of people has returned to God and you've been reconciled to God and you're going to go with great joy. You might have something to admit, confess, that's great. But overall, you've been returned to God and he has restored you and you're his son, his daughter. And you're going to take the bread and you're going to take the juice and it's going to be a celebration for you. And you're going to say, this is my only hope, Christ Jesus. He paid the infinite price to make me whole with him. I am complete in Jesus Christ. There's another group of people, and today, if God is working in your heart, I, I pray today be the first day you really take communion and mean it. You have been walking against the peace of God, the restoration of God. You have said, I got it, I got it. I can make up life as I go. I got this thing. And maybe today, by the work and grace of God, you've said, I don't got it. I'm not the Lord, I'm not God, and I need to return to the one who loves my soul, who created me, who planned out a life for me. I come in faith today, and I trust him. I admit today that I'm a sinner. I have rebelled against him. You know what a sinner is? It's a glory thief. It's a glory thief. I have wanted my own glory. My way, my thoughts, my words, my actions. I lay that down today. I give it up. I put my faith in Jesus Christ that he came and lived a perfect life. His perfect life can be given to me. I accept it. His death can be applied to me. I don't have to die. I accept his death. His resurrection life is what I want. Not my life as I dream it up and fix it up and try it up. I want his life in me. I come and receive Christ. Would you call on him before you take communion, then take communion as an act of faith. Announce to the demons. I don't think you're six inches away from a demon, by the way. I don't think you're six inches away from an angel. But you, the people you can see, that's just as important. Let them see. Tell them. Tell somebody today, this is my act of faith today. I am professing Christ. He died for me. He lives in me. I receive him by faith.